welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. And of course, we're going to be blessed primarily with Gary uh, as our speaker today. And thank you for the music. It was wonderful. Let's bow our heads. Gracious Father, thank you for your goodness and your constant ministry to us that we occasionally get to give something back to you. We ask your presence here today and that we would see you, that we would understand your plan for us and that that can be fulfilled in each of our lives and we can then help you fulfill that plan in our world and our community. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, as we have mentioned before, how many of you know what our topic today is? Relationships. Relationships. How does that pertain to health? <laughs> a lot. A lot, a lot, actually. It has a lot to do with our physical health, and it certainly has a whole lot to do with our whole person health um, as we go about life. So we're just going to do a little bit of recap, set the stage, and then turn it over to Gary. So we started with understanding how to put together a comprehensive understanding of health, that three quarters or the foundation is really our lifestyle for our physical health. But the lifestyle is not just a matter of your diet and exercise, it's the whole person lifestyle, including relationships. We started out in our first session talking about how, from a scientific perspective, scientists that are really studying human beings and how we tick and how we work, universally come to this conclusion of, we're here to what? Connect. We're here to connect. It's what we exist for. It's why we're here. So even people that don't believe in God end up saying, connection, it's why we're here. Okay, so as we understand physical health, physical health is not the end goal. We want the physical health such that we can better experience connection. More abundantly, more fully. Okay, and we're using this model of how we work as people that's very similar to a neuron that makes up what the cells that fill our head. Physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, and again, it's fundamentally all about connection in the horizontal and in the vertical. And that in our day-to-day -day experience, a lot of what healthy connection looks like, what the science points towards, actually looks and sounds a lot like what church could and should be, where we actually function and exist as a church family, truly connected and caring, and living in health-sustaining ways. Our second session we looked at this riddle, what is the universal desired outcome of human existence? What is it? Pleasure. pleasure. The Bible teaches there's this thing called the Garden of Eden. Eden means pleasure, the Garden of Pleasure. So whatever your religious perspective, whether you want to end up in heaven or nirvana or whatever, or you're an atheist and this is all you have, or you're a neuroscientist, we actually all believe we want to enjoy our existence as the fundamental outcome. That's universal humanity, human experience and in the big picture. And again, we want true pleasure, not just physical, but whole person, emotional, mental, social, spiritual, that is sustainable and that keeps going and doesn't give us just a short circuit burst for the moment. And then we started getting into and using the system of vitality is to look at each of these areas as whole people. We looked at resilience. What's resilience? Bounce back kind of the opposite of stress. So we looked at the stress cycle, again, looking at the, sort of a slice through the neuron, spiritual, mental, emotional, physical, and how stress works, and how we deal with it short-term and long-term, and building that resilience has a huge impact on our physical health directly and indirectly, because of that's kind of our battery for doing life and making decisions and doing things different than the world. We then looked at the fuel how many of you are here for the fuel one, just out of curiosity? A oh, fair number. So the core concepts being fuel by design. What are we built for? What is the appropriate fuel to run best on? And we summed that up very simply with the up diet. Unrefined plant foods, mostly, being our primary fuel supply, but also uniquely personalized things. Figure out what does and doesn't work for you. Those two principles will take care of about 95% of nutritional issues. For people. We then looked last time at chemicals, and not just chemicals, <clears throat> but also addictions. 
So when we look at chemicals and what we do as human beings, we find that the vast majority, this is coming in from the outside to the physical level, is in the, for the intentional purpose of changing, improving our mood or our mind, right? That's basically why we do them. It's self-directed and it's generally legal with some exceptions. And again, it taps into, we're trying to come from the outside to make us feel better on the inside, sometimes physically also. And that, how, well does, how well does that work? Short term, you feel better for the moment. That's why we do it. But long term, it's not sustainable. It self-destructs. It short circuits. And the real solution for this, which gets really cool, has a lot to do with how gratitude works. And gratitude is basically the response to good received. And I left out all the details for the uh, purpose of simplicity today, but when we have good coming at us, how we relate to that, how we receive that or don't receive it, and how it does or doesn't affect us is huge. And this basic cycle of receiving and giving good is basically how God set up the universe. And it's when we are satisfied and experiencing the deeper pleasures that we don't need to do the artificial things from the outside to get the physical and emotional pleasures that burn us out and don't work. So that's the basic cycle of addiction and what to do about it. And today we're talking about relationships. Relationships are huge for our physical health. Do you know that for blood pressure, <clears throat> patient comes to the doctor's office, if a doctor takes the blood pressure or a nurse or the medical assistant, do you know there's a difference in the blood pressure? A true, real difference? Which person is at the highest? The doctor. The doctor. Does that mean the doctors are bad for your health? No. They can be. Well, they can be. <laughs> you guys spoke up a little too quickly on that. <laughs> They've done studies looking at a patient in the hospital, when a doctor walks into the room, the blood pressure shoots up as much as 75 points for some people. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Just from the doctor walking into the hospital room. So there's a lot of different layers of effects of our relationships. A lot. And it really does affect our physiology moment to moment, day to day, in many, many different ways. So we're gonna get into a little bit of that um, today. Of course, it's all of human existence, so we're just gonna be scratching the surface today. In our neuron model, where are the relationships? What part of the neuron? The connections, but especially we're focusing on the horizontal connections today, the person-to-person -person relationships. Dendrites and axons for the neurons, yes. Later we're gonna talk about the spiritual or vertical connection. Now, just some things I came across in the last week or so that were pretty cool. This is just, you see the top, February 18. This is just this last week. Neuroscientists say they found an entirely new form of neural communication. Yeah, this is awesome. This is kind of rocking the neuroscience world. Scientists think they've identified a previously unknown form of neural communication that self-propagates across brain tissue and can leap wirelessly from neurons in one section of brain tissue to another, even if they've been surgically severed. So what they did is they took brain tissue and they like cut it apart under the microscope, so we're still microscope level, and they studied and they found that the neuron over here was inducing neuronal activity in the neuron over here with a clear gap between. Wow. Wow, so we've already known about the neurons and the axons, the direct wiring, but we're just now figuring out, it's like Wi-Fi. Bluetooth. Like how we're Bluetooth. It's like how, we're to how we're connected to God. This is pretty cool. And they, in this experiment, they did some things. They did an electromagnetic field that sort of augmented the field, and it augmented the communication. Then they did sort of a reverse field, and it blocked it. So it appears to be happening electromagnetically. It's pretty cool stuff. Another study I just came across, it was actually published in 2016, but this gets up to our community level relationships. They studied or compared network support versus your standard 
cognitive behavioral therapy, which is your counseling, your figuring it out, overcoming barriers, whatnot, sort of your gold standard, if you will. Network support was basically relationships. In this case, for people with alcohol use disorder, they're drinking too much. Okay, so this is just relationships. They, so they just got people connected with more non-drinkers, like AA, and taught them some basic relationship skills, pretty minimal. And what they found in this study, surprisingly, was that net, network support, these relationships, yielded better post-treatment results in terms of both proportion of days abstinent and drinking consequences, and equivalent improvements in 90-day abstinence, heavy drinking days, and drinks per drinking day. Sounds like a church. Mm -hmm. What a church could be. Do you know that as a church, with good, healthy relationships, we can have this effect on our world, on our community? And they didn't do anything fancy. Yes, there was some structure, but they followed these people out for two years. And if you look at the graphs, it was consistently more effective across the two years. Not deep, expensive counseling, just connecting with other human beings or basically doing normal living. So you don't have to have a counseling degree to benefit people. You just be their friend. You just live your own healthy life being their friend, and this is the effect you have on others. Have you heard all the study that talks about the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, it is connection. The opposite of addiction is not sobriety, it's connection. Amen. Yes, Work. that's what science shows. The opposite of addiction is connection. So let's understand these connections and then we're gonna turn this over. So this is all about the connections. I'm excited what Gary's gonna share and do with us today. There's a core concept or two I do wanna put on the table. What makes up a healthy connection? What makes it possible? Communication. Communication, Communication of what? Ideas? Ideas? Caring. Trust and vulnerability. Ah, trust. He didn't see my notes, by the way. No, I didn't. Trust. What makes up trust? How does trust come to be? Yeah, trust is, it is what makes relationship possible. This is like the wiring or the piping through which relationship happens. What's another word for trust? Faith, faith. What makes trust possible? What are the fundamental elements or principles of it? One is safety. Genuine, personal safety, which has a lot to do with caring. And the flip side of the same coin is freedom. You have to have safety and you have to have freedom to have trust. Then things can start to happen. Then you have a conduit, you have a connection, if you will, that good things can happen through. What gets really interesting is when you study salvation, the word salvation and the concepts, what you find is that at heart, it's these two issues. We're told we're saved by faith, right, which is trust. Safety, genuine safety is, salvation is safety and freedom. Salvation is safety and freedom. With that, we're gonna turn this over to the relationships maestro, Gary Parks. Good afternoon, y'all. I'm gonna unplug and plug, is that okay? In fact, I'll just let you do that because you're the left basal brain and I'm not. <laughs> By the way, it's really good to be home. Amen. We consider this place home. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'm really excited about what I get to do. Um, I am, I'm thrilled that in the world of Adventism, this is the first time that I know of anywhere where a conference said, we're not gonna take for granted that people know how to be nice. 
We have a lot of folks who are really adept at being right. But we might not be nice. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start looking at some of the things. And I'm going to just give you a quick whirlwind. And then we're going to give you one of the first tools that I, that I, I get to do in churches. And I've, I'll tell you, if I could just... If I could just tell you some of the things that I have experienced, I just, a few weeks ago, and I won't mention details because it's private, but I met in an office with eight elders and two people and worked out an issue in conflict that had been going on for five years. When we were done, and by the way, Matthew uh, says that uh, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm gonna show up. I'm not sending angels, I'm not sending anybody, but I'm gonna show up. And we usually use that for a poor attendance at prayer meeting. <laughs> but actually it's in, the, it's in the arena of conflict. If you are doing conflict the way I want you to do conflict, I'm gonna show up. And I just can't tell you, in that meeting, we didn't center on details, and by the way, there was written details this thick that I had in a manila envelope and I'd gone through every one of them and I'd studied it. And I said, let's, let's look, um, if you don't mind, I'm not gonna deal with the details. What I wanna do is deal with emotions this evening. And they all agreed and we walked through for two hours and just dealt and cared for each other's emotions and learned how to value each other. And when we were done, they each, and I went around the room and I said, is it done? and the four promises of forgiveness ensue. And you have to come to another one of my seminars to figure out what they are, but one of them is I will not talk about it to anybody else again. It is gone. Isaiah talks about Jesus when he says, I will remember their sins no more. He didn't say I'll forget. Would you rather live with a spouse who you hope will forget or you know will choose never to remember? Which is safer? It's the choice. And every one of them in the room said it's over and we're gonna tell the church because there had been people that left church because of the issue. They got up last Sabbath and they told the whole church that the issue is done. It's no longer, and they hugged each other. And, and, and one of them came up to me and he whispered in my ear, no, no, actually he called me. Called me on the way home. I'm 10 minutes into my drive on my way home. And he said, I never thought I would feel any feelings for that person again in my life. And by the end, I actually hugged him with an emotional hug. Amen. And we just prayed on the phone because God's promise where two or three are gathered, I will show up. So, um, what was that? Do I have paper? This is just for you, buddy. So uh, anybody know what the Pygmalion effect is? If you're an educator, you probably know that. Um, the Pygmalion effect, actually, uh, Dr. Rosenthal led teachers to believe. They actually did a bunch of studies on the kids. And, so, and then they, they gathered all the stuff from the studies. And they said to the teachers, these are the, these are the ones that are going to really pop out this year. They are intellectually and emotionally ready to grow. Woohoo! And they gave them a list of the students. Guess, at the end of the year when they tested them, who had actually grown the most? Those students, the interesting part of the study is that they chose the kids at random. Isn't that interesting? So intellectual bloomers, later studies show that the teachers unconsciously gave more positive attention and feedback and learning opportunities to those students who they were told were going to be bloomers. In short, teachers were able to non-verbally communicate their positive expectations for academic success for the students. They also did it for the military. Huh? There was another experiment with the military. The military's done the same thing. In fact, since the 90s, when he did this study, it has been studied in different places. By the way, businesses are suggesting now 
Businesses are suggesting now that if the bosses actually believe in the employees, their production goes up. I'm gonna give you an, uh, my, my first principle, and if you forget any principle that we have fun with today, do not forget this principle. Because if righteousness is safety and freedom, if that's really what it is, then literally the first principle in church is that we believe in each other, period. That I look at you and say, wow, if I was in your shoes, I wouldn't be doing as good as you're doing. Man, you're doing well. If you wanna, Ellen White even says this, by the way, a lot of stuff that I choose to use in some of my seminars hasn't been used a lot, because I think some folks read Ellen White looking for certain things. Now I'm reading Ellen White looking for certain things. There's different stuff. Listen to what she says. And I cannot overlook the valuable spiritual lesson that teaches, here's the teaching, God looks upon us not as we are today, in the course of our development, but he sees us as we shall be perfected in him when Christ shall come. So if you were to see him see you today, he would be going, wow, that's pretty good, better than I thought. For you see, when people view you that way, you literally become, and if Ellen White has many statements, we won't take a lot of time today, but she says how the very little movements for good and evil can be down the road huge. Just a way you look, a way you smile, the way you don't smile, the way you carry yourself, the way you carry yourself, things matter. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies. If you look at the word bodies in the Hebrew, it is not an individual one, that's Western culture. Bodies means corporate. So not only does God expect me to change personally and change my behavior to his behavior and buy into what he says I should do in a relational aspect, He also suggests that if East Salem gets together, it will have a unique personality that will win people in Salem area. And it will be different than it is in Milwaukee. It'll be different than it is in Georgia. So some of the skills that we go through, I go to churches for 10 to 12 weeks, maybe sometimes 14, and we build community. We start practicing community. So some of the things we practice, I do the DISC test just because I believe that it shares that we're a lot different. And when you get into groups, it's sort of fun to play with. We'll talk a little bit more about that today. Um, That's the first one that I do. Then we talk about actually how to listen. Did you know that Jesus tells us how to listen? And most of us don't listen well. Because when one person's talking, guess what the other person's thinking? What they're gonna say. And when the other person's talking, guess what the other person's? Jesus was the master artist of listening and asking questions. I believe those skills are are lost today. We also talk about forgiveness emotionally, which I just shared a story about. We also talked about being a safe place. When I started sharing these with some folks, Um, I had, and by the way, this works. I had a a physician come to me the other day, gave me a license to share this. He was having struggles in his home. When I went through what we're gonna go through today, he says, wow, I had no idea. I I haven't been connecting with my family well. He said, would you teach me? I've sat with him when we've prayed and we studied together and he's changed, he's changed, literally. And he sent me a text the other day and it says, I could read it to you, it says, I tried what you said and it worked. Voila! (laughs) I had another physician come to me and he said, the doctor, my nurse came to me the other day and said, what's happened to you? And he said, well, what do you mean? You're different. You're actually likable. (laughs) (laughs) Must have had a good relationship. (laughs) 
We talk about Bible study. Oftentimes we as Christians uh, uh, attach and go to the Bible to find truth so that we can be right. And the minute we start acting as if we're right, we lose righteousness. Did you know that? We lose freedom. Now you've got to believe the way I believe because I found it and now I've got to make you. And no longer do we have the freedom to follow Jesus. We talk about meeting emotional needs. It's interesting in Jesus' way of ministry, those of you who know me would know that, that I'm, I'm into that. Jesus' way of ministry is a few steps. He mingled with men as one who desired their good. You had the uncanny feeling that when you were with him, he actually liked you. He mingled with men as one who desired their good. I'm not mingling with you to desire what I want you to do. I'm mingling with you to desire what you want. He sympathized with them as the second one. That means he entered into emotion. We as Adventists aren't trained a lot on emotion. He sympathized with them. He met their needs. Well, what were the needs he's heard? Emotional needs. He met their needs. He won their confidence, trust. And then he said, if you see any good, follow me. I'll make you a fisher of men. If you'll notice, most of that process is emotional, is it not? If being right could change the world, the Republicans and the Democrats would have changed us already. But it's interesting that they'll kill each other over differences. Anyway, then we talk about conflict resolution. How do you go about doing a conflict well? Um, to know when it starts and to when it ends. We won't spend a lot of time on this. We talk about lifestyle, personal testimony, knowing Jesus personally, not knowing about Jesus. There's a difference, my friends. And the last one is self-awareness. And that means if you're self-aware about how you come across. And so today we're gonna talk just a little bit more about that. And I won't go any more into that. That'll be another day. But what we're gonna do right now All right, here. We're gonna try something fun to that today. This is, um, could a greater miracle take place than for us to look through each other's eyes for just an instant? Henry David Thoreau said. If you've seen that wonderful uh, video from uh, a hospital somewhere where it goes through and it has these people walking through the hospital and it has labels about what's going on in their life. I think that's what's happening when Jesus walked this earth. He could read people well. And I think it deserves uh, some attention to learn to read people better than we do. It's actually the, the, the Apple boy who said technology alone is not enough. We need desperately need the expertise of those who are educated to the human. Jobs was also known for favoring passion over experience in his employees. Isn't it interesting? Two guys in the late 90s actually met at Stanford. One was from the Soviet Union and one was from Michigan. They didn't like each other, but they saw goodness in each other. And so they met together and they said, we can be better together than we are separate. And you'll never guess who these boys are. They are the founders of Google. One of them said actually, um, I thought he was pretty obnoxious <laughs> when he met the other one. Interesting, when they got there and they got the company going, they put a, if you want to call a rubric together and about how they were going to hire folks. And they said, we're going to hire them the best under STEM, science, technology, engineering, what stands for M? 
Absolutely, math, the solid ones, because we're a high-tech company and we want to be a really good high-tech company, so we're going to get the best of the best. And they hired them with really high scores in STEM. Fifteen years later, they studied themselves and they found that those who were promoted and that those actually who really helped the company succeed better had nothing to do with STEM. It had everything to do with, do you know how to do conflict well? Do you know how to like your fellow coworkers? Do you know how to listen to your fellow coworkers? And they call them in the business world, soft skills. I think Jesus was the master of the soft skills. And maybe outside of East Salem, could I say in Adventism, just maybe we aren't as good at soft skills. I've actually been to churches that have had things and, and fights going on between people and I'll sit down with them and ask them, by the way, what's the fight about? And I can't figure it out because they don't know. They just know that their parents didn't like those people and did you know that the sins of the fathers visit to the, wow. The Lord will not accept, in the upward look, page 267, Ellen White says this, the, world, the Lord will not accept the work of any man that is not done in, say it with me, tenderness and love and kindness. And yet in the name of God, we will kill each other. She goes on to say, he's not set us as rulers to lord it over his heritage. Let others be moved by Christ just as we desire to be moved. She goes on to say, harmony and unity existed among men of very dispositions. In other words, we're all different. Amen? I am so glad. I love working with Mark because Mark has a brain that is not mine. Did you notice how he hooked that up? He hooked it up so much better than I ever would have. But she says... The witness that can be born that God has sent his son into the world to save sinners, this is the strongest witness if we actually can get along even though we're different. You tell me anywhere in the world today where that is happening outside of church. It is not. In fact, people are getting more immature and another one of the issues will go on. I just talked to a gentleman the other day and he said that the majority of Americans are 15 to 19 years old emotionally and connectively. So when you don't play the game well, I just take my little toys and I go home and I leave the sandbox. And it's time for a world to grow up, if I can say it that way. In fact, let me throw this out, because in the Bible it actually says that a really seasoned, mature Christian, Second Peter talks about maturity, a real seasoned, mature Christian will never be offended. What is it with America that we're offended over everything? Seasoned Christians are never offended. By our unity, we are to bear strong, indisputable evidence that Christ came to this world to save sinners. Satan works with all his ingenuity to prevent human beings from bearing this evidence. Now you know why churches don't get along. It's because the devil's pointed focus is to make sure you don't like each other in church because once you do, the power will come and people will be attracted because nowhere in the world are there people that don't want to get along with people, but none of them know how. Men, women professing godliness build walls of separation between them and their fellow workers because not all think in exactly the same way or follow the exactly the same methods. Those who stand apart refuse to harmonize, dishonor God before the world. Wow. And there's all kinds of wonderful stuff, but we don't have time. But I just want you to know that Ellen White is filled with information that I had never heard growing up. Um, but the early Christians began to look for defects in one another. Aha. Oh. Dwelling upon mistakes, encouraging suspicion. Did you know what I saw him doing the other day? and doubt giving way to unkind criticism, they lost sight of who? They lost sight. 
because they wanted to be right and they're building a case against people rather than going out thinking the best until proven right. That's what my son taught me when he was nine. Think the best until proven right. Let me give you where he found that in 1 Corinthians. I don't think he found it there, but it's there. Believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. What would happen if 200 people had your back? What would happen if 200 people would think the best until they were proven right? Because there's no chance that they would ever be wrong. Interesting relationship stuff. In their zeal to condemn others, they themselves erred. They forgot the lesson of brotherly love that Christ had taught. And saddest of all, they were unconscious of their loss. Wow. They did not realize that happiness and joy were gone. For I believe, as Mark does, that we were made for joy. The Apostle John realized that brotherly love was waning in the church and he dwelt particularly upon this point, so we're gonna do that today. But sometimes churches do, well, could I say this? Now, oftentimes churches won't do this physically because we're way too immature. But we will do it. If you're in a church very long, it's fun for me to go in for 12 weeks because I hear things and I watch groups And I watch people not like people. And granted, there are some people that you wish their parents had never met. That's life. That's why God doesn't say we have to phileo love everybody. But it does say we have to agape love everybody. Because in agape loving, we share the character of our heavenly father. I've done a lot of weddings and never once have I done a wedding when I'm standing there with the two people in front of me and one of them goes, oh, I suppose so. They are in 100%. They are attuned. They are ripe. They are ready. And six months later, their boat sometimes looks like it's sinking. Something has happened. Ellen White says that in families, we are all different. Wow, I had a rude awakening when I had three different children. My first son was a lot like me. I thought I had it down pat. And then I had Ariana. Thank you. Oh, boy. And when she was six or seven years old, I, I, I was learning some of the stuff that we're going to talk about today. And so I gave her a three by five card. This is an uneducated father. Hang with me. I gave her a pink three by five card. And I said, tell me what your dad needs to do to enter your world. And she wrote three things. Remind me, I'll tell you what they are when we get into it today because it changed my life and rocked my world because she was so different than I was. And for me to love my daughter, I had to take my glasses off and put her glasses on. By the way, Listen to the little lady, Ellen White. I just love what she has to say in these, because I've never heard this stuff before. I advise and exhort that those who have change of the youth, or charge, excuse me, shall learn how to adapt themselves to meet the youth where they are by learning useful lessons themselves of him who was meek and lowly of heart that they may bring into their life and character the love of Jesus. They should be, say it with me, kind, cheerful, and courteous, and bind the hearts of the youth to their hearts by strong cords of love and discipline. These are all emotional words, my friends. So a good, good question would be, how you doing? I know when I look at some of this, I go, wow. Do not be afraid. Say this with me. Do not be afraid to let them know that you love them. And some of us grew up, luckily I had parents that didn't believe that, but most of us, kids should be seen and yeah. See, you heard that too. And back in the 1800s, she knew different. And she got that from the Holy One. 
families are different. The problem with communication, George Bernard Shaw says, is the illusion that it's actually taken place. H.M. Tomlinson said, we see things not as they are, but as we are, see if you buy the idea, our perceptions are shaped by our previous experiences. Would you say that's true? We'll just check and see if you all think differently today. Um, so if a woman says, I've got nothing to wear, what does she mean? She wants a new dress. She wants a new dress. Thank you very much. So there could be a lot of dresses already in the closet. They may even be new. They're definitely clean. Okay. If, if a man says, I've got nothing to wear. I had one gentleman stand up and he said, I've used both sides of the underwear and it's all dirty. <laughs> Let's check out your perceptions. As I show you this picture, what's your perception? Let's just see if we all perceive the exact same thing. Furthermore, perceive that we're right. Resting. Resting. Absolutely. What else? He, he, he's in an airport. What was that? He's long layover. I wonder how you know that, Troy. Maybe he's a wannabe Olympian because he's got a Puma bag. It's interesting because your perceptions are, are wonderful, but they're wrong. If you'll notice, over here there's plexiglass. Did you notice that? This is actually a plastic statue done by Dwayne Hansen called The Traveler. It's in the Orlando airport. And what they would actually do is people were coming up and uh, trying to wake him up for his flight and they were rubbing him off. <laughs> and so they had to cover him. Which one do you think is the plastic statue? <laughs> we're all afraid to say it's the one on the left it's the cleaning lady she is the plastic statue so we'll try this now which one is taller neither. interesting neither of them okay and now you're on to me so thank you very much but it is interesting when you change the room and you build the room different isn't it interesting how perceptions can change so if I were to ask you what color is a yield sign, of course you would say what? Absolutely. But you would be wrong. Now, now before we go there, I just want to let you know that in the 70s they were yellow, so some of you quit looking at signs. <laughs> so you need to go back and refresh. You've all seen these, haven't you? You all see both of the ladies, the, the younger lady and the one that has some age on her. Y'all see both of them? Is there anybody here that doesn't see any woman in that picture? <laughs> Talk to me afterwards. We'll see what happens. What do you see here? Okay, a guy playing a really long saxophone. And a woman's face. Isn't it interesting? Some of you see one thing and some of you see another. Perceptions, my friends, differ. Perceptions differ. I love to ride bikes down in the, uh, the wonderful bird refuge down by my house, and I, this means nothing to anybody, but I, had, I saw a, a picture of a nesting falcon, and I thought I would just share it with you. <laughs> what was your perception? You were expecting a bird. What's actually happening here, I won't take time because of time. I think we're supposed to be done by what time, Mark? Well, I think we're going to give some flexibility. Okay, so 3.30 maybe. You can leave when you want. We aren't holding you. We believe in righteousness, which is freedom. <laughs> so leave when you want. You keep talking and I'll stay Thank you. So, so what's happening here is literally in the brain, there's actually two ways to look at most everything. And some of us will gravitate towards one 
uh, before we would the other. And some folks will gravitate towards another. Listen to what Ellen White has to say here. She says, every association of life calls for the exercise of self-control, forbearance, and sympathy. We differ so widely in disposition, in habits, in education, that our ways of looking at things do what? Isn't that interesting? We judge differently. Our understanding, believe it or not, of truth, our ideas in regard to the conduct of life, when we should wade, when we shouldn't wade, what we should eat, should we eat out on Sabbath, or should we not pay for food on Sabbath, or should we drive on Sabbath, or how far should we drive on Sabbath, should we pack on Sabbath, and are not all in respects the same. There are no two whose experience is alike in every particular. The trials of one are not the trials of another. So please, my friends, let's be real easy, because what is real easy for me to you could be horrendously hard. But by the way, what's really hard for you I might be pretty good at. She goes on to say, so frail, so ignorant, so liable of misconception is human nature that each should be very careful at the estimate he places upon another. We little know the bearings of our acts upon the experiences of others. What we do or say may seem to us of little moment when our eyes could be opened we should see that upon it depended the most important results for good or evil. I had an experience in my first church that almost had me change from being a minister. I was that close to going home and quitting because of one statement that one man made in a church. And he has no idea, he made it offhandedly. It rocked my world. Watch your statements, my friends. She goes on to say you need to educate yourself to the mind. You should with some have compassion making a difference while others you may save with fear pulling them out of the fire. We deal differently. Spec scans have proved that you actually function in different places of your brain. So we won't take much time in that except to say um, Arlene Taylor uh, Realizations Incorporated came up with this. She's out of California by PUC. The left frontal lobe to set and achieve goals and make timely and objective decisions. We're going to talk about them. These are the people who are, 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 let's get her done. My way or the highway. God sent out an email and told you all that I'm in charge and I hope you got it. And if you didn't, I'll send you a copy of mine. These are those folks. We'll talk about the Bible person there. The right frontal lobe to anticipate, make changes, visualize, innovate. These are the talkers. These are the ones who love to tell stories. These are the ones who love to engage with people. They do not like sermons, but whenever I say share with your neighbor, oh, they're on. And when I say come back, they go, we're not done. The right posterior lobe, when I say share with your neighbor, fear goes through their heart. I have to talk with someone I don't know. I'm going home. And then the left posterior lobe to provide and supply, maintain services that are needed for sustaining life. These are the folks who actually uh, cross the T's and dot the I's. And they want you to do the same. So I, I've gone back to him. Uh, we're, gonna, we're not gonna talk about your genetic traits. Relax, your family's safe. We're not gonna talk about your personality because it's really tough to change personality, but what I'm gonna talk about today is your behavior. Did you know that you can change behavior? I challenge you to find anybody in the New Testament that followed Jesus that didn't change behavior. So that's what we're gonna talk about. It's, it's situationally based, it's flexible, it's an expression of your personality. It's, we're not gonna talk about your intelligence, your values, your experience, or your education. Cool, but we are gonna say that sometimes we view things differently. <laughs> is it not true? Which is it? This can happen in church, and one thinks I'm doing just fine, thank you very much, and the other one's just crushed. So if you want to, we're gonna give you a, a test for those of you who wanna stick around. Yeah, would you just pass that out? Thank you. 
Sure, you can pass both of them out. That's the, that's the one I want first. Do you mind taking a test or are we wanting to be done? We can song, okay? Okay, we'll take a test because I think you'll learn some stuff, insightful. Um, by the way, um, in big businesses, they do this all the time to help people get along. Um, on the back of the sheet, not the colored site, you will see some lists of numbers like this, and I'm just gonna have you circle numbers. I made it easy. Who was it? Uh, Tom Sawyer or somebody said that there's always two ways to spell every good word. Um, so I tried to avoid spelling errors, and we're just gonna have you circle stuff. It's gonna be simple. Everybody have a pencil? So what's gonna happen, we're gonna start with the left side. The left side is pace. P-A-C-E, that's, that's how fast you move or how more moderate pace you move. I'm going to say number one, and I'm gonna make a statement, and I'm gonna say number two, and I'm gonna make a statement. And whichever is more true about you, I'd like you to circle that number. Okay, so for, are, are we all ready? Ooh, don't wanna move yet. No, no, you're fine. Take your time. You're gonna circle either a one or a two in the pace side. The first question will be between one and two. The next question will be between three and four, you're gonna make a choice. And then you're gonna make a choice between four and five. Okay, I mean five and six. I think we'll get it all. Everybody ready? Which page are we circling? That's it, that's the one with the list of numbers. Perfect, you got it. On the other side of the other, there you go. We found numbers. Right here, Mom, on this yeah. side. Turn it on this side. We are on pace. Thank you for that clarification. I'm not sure I understand what we're doing. Okay, you're going to get it. Hang on with me. Okay. Here, here we go. Here are the, here's the first choice, y'all. So number one, I like to make my decisions quickly. Circle a one if you do that. Or number two, I take time before I decide. If you're struggling with that, just circle two. Okay? If you're struggling with it at all, just circle two. Don't even waste a lot of time. And by the way, this will not pigeonhole you. These are your answers, don't get mad at me. But it will say some things, and by the way, there's 40 million of them done worldwide. And uh, the gentleman who came up with it was in the 1920s, William Marston. And it, it's, it's proved out pretty true. You're gonna choose between three and four now. Number three, I enjoy juggling several projects at once, or number four, I prefer to finish one thing before I start the next. Which is more true about your brain? And the last choice, five, I like change and trying new things, or six, I don't like change. I like to do things in familiar ways. Which is more true about you? Now is where you will see the frontal lobe people saying, could you change the slide? I'm done. But the minute I change the slide, there will be a basal person who will say, I need to go back to, I'm not sure if I'm fast or slow yet. And I would just say, put two. <laughs> just circle two. Are we ready to move on? Yes. Okay, make sure. Here's the next group. Seven, eight. Seven, in a group I usually introduce myself. Or number eight, I, in a group I usually wait for someone to introduce me. Which is more true about you in how you function? Nine and 10. Nine, sometimes I struggle to listen well. Or 10, I am a patient listener. Eleven and twelve. Eleven, I'm spontaneous and fast acting, or twelve, I'm more deliberate and careful. 
you know what, you can, and it, it, it'll be fun when we do the numbers, but you're sure welcome, I'm not here, it's, there's freedom. Because yes, I am forcing you to make a choice. So again, this will not pigeonhole you, but it will say when we go through the different brains, you're gonna go, oh, that is me, or that's not me, so. Are we ready to move on? The frontal ones right now are just about ready to walk out because if we're gonna go this slow over these two lists, um, and, and then there are people who are saying, now what was one and two? Um, I need to go back. 13, I get bored when I have nothing to do. 14, I need downtime to relax and recharge. 15 and 16, 15, I tend to speak and gesture quickly. Or 16, I tend to speak and gesture a little bit more slowly. By the way, you're gonna see a fascinating theological difference when we get to looking at these different brains. A lot of our arguments in Adventism come from our differences. 17, I sometimes get impatient when people aren't fast enough. If you've already felt like you wanted me to go a little faster, you can circle 17. If, you're, if I'm going pretty comfortable speed, circle 18. In fact, if you need to go back, circle 18. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll see you later, Troy. <laughs> That's why I like working with you, Troy. Your brain is a lot like mine. That's a scary thought for folks around us. Mm -hmm. 19 and 20. 19, I'm a take charge person who does things fast. Or 20, I'm a detail oriented person who does things carefully. Twenty-one and twenty-two. Twenty-one, I share my opinion easily, or twenty-two, I am more reserved with my opinion. I should have told you, uh, you could take the rest of it. If you have someone in your world that you don't like, or if you have a child you're struggling with, it's interesting to take the test for them, because I can tell you what the issues will be. Last one, 23, I'd rather find new ways to do things, or 24, I'd rather follow the directions. You can sort of see this on Christmas morning when you open up a thing that needs to be put together. Uh, some folks like Troy will probably just dive in and put it together, and if you lose a couple screws, no big deal. If you got a couple extra, we'll actually fabricate it and we'll make it better. But then there are those people who put out the screw and put out the pliers and get everything set out. They'll read through the directions and then they'll start putting it together. All right, are we all done with this list? Anybody need anything left on this list? We're gonna go now to the priority side. Please, question. Nineteen and twenty. If you're neither, we need to have a talk afterwards. Okay? Um, I would just throw up a coin and say which is most likely. Just throw the coin up. This isn't something where we meditate for long periods of time. Although some of you really want to, and I know that you want to. This is more just the first thing that comes up. And again, it's not to pigeonhole you, and it's not to pigeonhole people, but it is to say that when I'm talking with a certain brain lead, I'm going to share the gospel vastly different than when I'm talking with another brain lead. All right, number, we're gonna now go to priority. You'll notice, you'll notice right over here it says priority. Just want you to know, so that's what that's all about. Number one, I would rather know my work is finished. Is that more important to you? Or number two, I would rather know my team's happy with me. Which is more important in your world? Not bad or good, just which is more important. Number three and four. Number three, I'm more often convinced by evidence and objective facts. Um, could I suggest that might be Revelation seminars? And number four, I'm more often convinced by stories of how people's lives were changed. That would be personal testimony. 
That makes a huge difference in some people's lives, more than evidence and facts. The last two, five and six, five, I keep my eyes open for problems that need to be solved. Or six, I keep my eyes open for people that I can connect with. Which is more true for you? Do you want me to help you, Linda? I, I think I would, if I'd say six. Anybody that knows Linda, you want to help her? I at least know that the Linda that I know is a six, but that doesn't mean that you aren't, but you are very connective. Seven and eight. Seven, I tend to be more serious and straightforward. Or eight, I tend to be more fun, loving, and playful. You'll see these folks in church. You'll see the serious ones. They look like they've been weaned on dill pickles. (laughs) Dill pickles. Nine and ten. Nine people might think I'm harder to get to know, or ten people might think I'm easy to get to know. And the last choice on this slide, we've only got six more choices, so hang on. Eleven, I'd rather talk about current events and jobs to be done, or twelve, I'd rather talk about people and fun stories. What do you find yourself talking more about? Are we ready to move on? All right, you betcha. I guarantee you there's somebody in here wanting to go back to a certain number or two. 13 and 14, 13, I often keep my feelings to myself, or 14, I open up about my feelings to others. Sometimes it's fun to let folks take this for their spouse. You get it all wrong. (laughs) 15 and 16, 15, I'm more interested in how I'll get the job done, or 16, I'm more interested in who's gonna do the job with me. I'll give you a clue. When I work on my car that Troy's been so kind to help me with for I don't know how many years now, I don't like to do it when he's not there. I like to do it when he's there because we have a ball together, but it's really lonely working on a piece of metal alone. So now you know where my brain is. Yeah, 17 and 18. 17, I like to manage who I meet and how I get to know them. And 18, I'm more open to meeting people and getting to know them better. All right, are we all ready? Here we go, the last three choices, 19 and 20. 19, I'd rather work alone, or 20, I would rather work in a group. Twenty-one and twenty-two. Twenty-one, I am more of a thinker. Twenty-two, I'm more of a feeler. How do you view yourself? And the last one, which is the toughest one for my brain. Twenty-three, I'm happiest when I'm getting things done. Or twenty-four, I'm happiest when other people are happy with me. That's a, that's a struggle for my brain. That's sort of... It's what? It's both, yeah, but which one? What were you saying, Troy? It should be said. It's happiest when I'm getting things done, and I'm happiest when I'm working with others to get things done. You know, Troy, you are an engineer. Just leave it alone. It's broke. Okay, you'll notice at the bottom of each list, it says how many odd numbers you circled and how many even numbers you circled in each list. So count how many odd numbers you circled in each list and count how many even numbers you circled in each list. If you add those numbers together, they should equal 12. If they don't, you're probably a frontal right and it doesn't matter anyway because you'll never use it again. It was a good idea. (laughs) 
And let me know when your math is done. Anybody need help? I'll be glad to help. It should, if you have six odds, you should have six evens. Well, it would be preferable. At least that's the way it was intended. Not right or wrong, just that's the way it was intended. But if you happen to have eight and eight, well, you have an extra personality and it's wonderful. Does everybody have it done? Yep. All right. What I want you to do is I want you to plot this now, so hang with me. I'm gonna teach you how to plot this. On the pace, on your pace score, you will take, if you'll notice up here, it says the odd numbers. So on your pace score between fast and moderate, you will put a dot somewhere along this line from here up. Mine would be right about here. But wherever yours is, just put a little dot right on that line from zero up for the odd numbers in your pace score. Your even numbers will be plotted from zero down to 12. You'll see it down here. The even numbers will be, if you don't have any, you would just circle zero, Troy. And I probably could have told you that. <laughs> and those of you who are going ahead will be able to know that on the priority list, you will plot your evens from zero to the left and those, I mean the odd ones, zero to the left and the even ones from zero to the right. So you should have two points on the vertical line and you should have two points on the horizontal line. That would make four points. No problem, thank you. So, the pace is, oh, you're perfect. There oh, we go. <laughs> there, so, perfect. so, six and six. Okay. Right there and there. Perfect. We're going to have a perfect person here. No, no, no. Two and ten. Uh oh, you screwed up there. <laughs> Two and ten. Okay. Now I can tell you why you couldn't figure it out because you're just like sort of my brain up there. Yes. Oh, good. I love people who struggle with this because I did when I first took it. I don't know. I Two and ten. So. Did I get that right? Two. Yep. And ten. Yeah, you got that right. What are you struggling with? And then the second one is ten and two. So 10 and two, you got it. Okay. Now what you do is take your pencil and go up, across over here, down over here, like that. And no wonder, by the way, I just want you to know, he asked because he wanted to get it right. He's the kind of person who wants to get it right. And some of you are wishing you had, now when I say, um, now when I say connect the dots, do not make a kite if you can help it. Try to actually, and let me show you, don't go from here down over to here and then down over to here. Go all the way out over and make a box. You can make a kite if you would like to, but this is sort of gonna show a little bit better right here. So just connect all the dots and some of, and I say, thank you. I, I knew, I always have somebody said, where's the ruler? People will have their wallets out or they'll have a hymnal out or they'll have a, an envelope out and they'll start to make these perfect lines. I guarantee you that a high eye will never ever use a ruler. Never want to use a ruler. They don't even know what rulers are for. What? Yeah, 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 I mean, who cares? I, really, I got the picture. Let's move on. Can we get into groups and have fun? How about it? So after we got a number, what we're supposed to do? After we got a number? So I want you then just to connect. So go uh, out here, down here, across over here, and up over here and down there. Just make a square I got it. like that. Thanks for asking. Yes. What was that? Odd with priority was left. Okay. Right here. You can see it there. Thanks for asking. 
Does everybody got it? <laughs> yes, I already know where your brain is. Some of you are still working on getting it perfect. If it was left up to seize, my friends, if it was left up to seize, we would, we would never build a building because there's always engineering that could be better. Finally, the D says, enough is enough. Let's build the building. But nobody wants to be in the buildings unless the I's and the S's are in there because it's not going to be a fun place. The eyes just want to have a good time. In fact, if it was left up to eyes, we would be living in teepees, smoking peace pipes, and having a ball. Who cares about buildings? All right, does everybody have it done? Awesome. We're going to do it now. We're going to take a look at this. I've put animals here. This doesn't mean this is what you look like. And I will tell you, but most often, hear me out now, I'm going to speak of two different terms when I talk about this, because as I've studied this, I recognize that there are converted Ds and there are unconverted Ds. If you know Jesus, your behavior will have been altered by him already. If you know about Jesus, but don't know him, you may still offend somebody in the first five minutes that you're around them. Because D's will tend to do that. As I watched in church, I would have people come to me all the time. And even now when I'm in different churches, people will come up and say, that person is the most irritating. They, they don't have any empathy at all. It's gotta be their way or the highway. If you want to know who these people are, by the way, the D's, they're very determined. D stands for directive and determined. Um, they're very strong-willed. Getting on an elevator, they will get on the elevator and turn and push the door close button several times. Especially if other people are wanting to get on. To the average person, that is viewed as rude. If you ask them, and I've asked many of them, if you ask them, they say, it's not rude. I just know that if I get to work, the world will be a better place because they are movers and shakers. They get things done, and I'm going to get to work, and the people will be better off. So let me go. You'll see them on the side of the road trying to get the crosswalk. And the interesting thing is that those buttons, if you hit it once, it activates it but it is the number one replaced buttons because of people who abuse it. The eyes are the interactive ones, influencing. They're the life of the party. Could I say this publicly, and I don't think he would mind, Jerry McGee? Those of you who know Jerry McGee, he's up front, he's always telling a story, he always has a smile on his face, he's always talking to people. Um, the eye that gets on the elevator, instead of trying to close it, they'll actually, they haven't read the manual on elevators, which says when you get in an elevator, you kindly turn around quietly and you watch the numbers until they move, until it's time to get off, and you don't say anything and you walk out. No, they get on the elevator and they look around and they say, I suppose you wonder why I've called you all here. Woohoo! Hey, there's somebody that should go with us. We'll hold the door. And they don't even want to go. <laughs> the more the merrier. There you go. The S stands for soft hearted and supportive. They don't like you to talk much over this. That's yelling. If you talk over this, it's yelling. If you have an edge to your tone, mm -hmm. now a good, a good person like me that's up in the upper quadrant, I'd say, well, you want to hear yelling. I'll show you yelling. Guess how well that works. The S that gets on the elevator will stand and there's two elevators and they'll move from one line to the other. Oh, you go ahead, no, no, oh no, you go ahead, no, no. 
And if somebody has to stay back, guess who will stay back? They will, because they are facilitators of relationships, of people. Now the C's aren't so much people oriented. They're very factual, so most C's will get on the elevator. I I challenge you to watch for this. They'll get on the elevator and they will look for the capacity sign, 2,500 pounds. And they'll start looking at people and they'll start calculating. (laughs) And if we are overweight, they will ask somebody else to get off. Well, it only makes sense because they were the last one on that they get off. Now, an S would never ask somebody else to get off. Never. They would offer to get off. So could I suggest in churches, sometimes S's overwork themselves and kill themselves because they're wanting desperately to help, and if somebody needs to play the piano in the kindergarten room, and they have five jobs already, they're gonna offer to do it anyway. Conscientious. These are the folks who, well, you'll know if you, if you live with somebody that is a C, or if you are one, if you have ever tried to reload a dishwasher that somebody didn't load correctly, You see, an I will rarely get the dishes in the dishwasher anyway. The D's might hire somebody to put the dishes in the dishwasher. The S's, as long as they're with somebody, will be glad to help put them in there. But the C's will reload the dishwasher because you didn't get it right. Because there is a right way to load a dishwasher. Well, uh, but, but to them, it's true. There is a right way to get the dishes the cleanest. So, so, so my, my, my monkey friend, <laughs> my wife happens to be an SC and I happen to be an ID. And so I, I just decided one time, this is wrong. I can beat her. I can get more dishes in there than she can. And I pack that thing full. And that's exactly what she asked. She said, but this plate's not going to get clean because it's over this plate. And this, okay. She won. Yes, dear. Yes, dear. Sometimes it's better to have relationships than it is to be right. If you would like a principle, it's better to have a relationship than it is to be right. What about the I? Did you, did you include the I? I don't remember that. Oh yes, I included the I. The, I. the dishes don't get in? The dishes don't get in. <laughs> Unless there's the people I around. The, oh, I'm sorry, interactive. Oh, interactive. Interactive. <laughs> They're also influencing. They love to influence people. Now see, a D, won't in, a D won't influence people. They will try to control things and they will try to power over the world and they'll try to change your mind and they'll come at you strong. That's how Ds function. You can see them on boards. By the way, it's very interesting that some boards that I've sat on, there's very few S's. You know why? S's don't like conflict. And the D's and the I's aren't there either because it's not fun. Who wants to spend time sitting on a meeting unless we're going to have something to eat or have some interaction? So the people who are left on church boards usually are the D's and the C's. And the D's are just sure they're going to get their way. And the C's know that they're right, so they're going to stick around to win. Please. Somebody said, I'd rather lose an argument to you than to lose you to an argument. Absolutely. But, but could I suggest that that would be on the right side of the scale? That's never on the left side of the scale. Huh? Yes, that's the same. But again, that's relationally oriented to a D or a C. That doesn't work. The D or C is that I really need you to hear me out and to think I'm right. So I'm going to do whatever I need to do to get you to think I'm right. Do you see where the struggles come in? 
Yes, dear, thank you. <laughs> These make quick decisions, they're agents of change, they're results focused, they're courageous, they're direct, they're commanding, I lead, you follow, my way or the highway. And they're often competitive. By the way, even in relationships, it's about winning and losing. If you happen to be married to somebody who is there, and again, remember, so here's some of the things, and I'm not gonna go through it because of time, because we're way over time. So I'll, I'll speed up a bit. The Ds, their, their fear is loss of control. And they don't like being taken advantage of. You'll notice their confidence, their tendencies get immediate results, and we won't go through all this stuff. This is good stuff, but we'll do it later. The I is influencing, optimistic. My son taught me about I. He said the cup is always, yeah, I thought it was half full too. He said the cup is always full. He said there's air. That is a quintessential I who thinks outside the box and it's always gonna be positive. And those of you who know Zachary know that he just loves to talk and he's just out there and he is a life and he just loves to be with people. Um, they're enthusiastic, high-spirited, emotional, spontaneous. They seek acceptance and recognition. Often people think that that is because they're egocentric. It is not. It is because their value comes from outside in. Hear me here. If you happen to live with an eye, their value comes from outside in. So your responses to them tell them what their value is. Now, I'm not saying that should happen that way, but it is the way it happens. If you listen to an I preach and you give him feedback, you'll get better sermons because they're waiting for feedback. And if you give them no feedback, they'll hurry up, close it up, button it up, and leave. The I's, they will, they hate social rejection and disapproval and loss of influence. They tend to be impulsive, disorganized. They will organize themselves and they can organize themselves. The problem with being organized is that it takes time away from being with people. So they have a lot of projects that they would love to get done, but somebody calls and says, let's go to lunch, and guess what? They go to lunch. And so they've got a lot of projects still waiting to be done. The S's, and I'll speak in a softer voice. Because my, my daughter actually, those of you who know Ariana know her. She uh, speaks softly. She speaks a little slower. So I used to go by and say, Zachary, clean your room. He'd go, okay, dad. I'd go by and say, Ariana, clean your room. <laughs> Dad's yelling at me. Yelling? I am just checking off the list of things I got to do. And all I'm asking you to do is clean your room. But you see, to her, the way she viewed it, with the strength of my tone, she viewed me as, as yelling. So who's right? Ellen White says that I should enter my daughter's world and, and deal with her the way she needed to be dealt. So being the father that I was, I gave her the th three by five pink card and I said, would you write down the three things that I need to do to really enter your world because obviously I'm not getting it. And by the way, at six or seven years old, she was pulling away from me emotionally. And I sensed that luckily because I have a wonderful wife who helped me learn to emotionally engage, which I didn't learn growing up. This is what my daughter said. She said, could you speak softly? Okay. Number two, when you come into my room, would you act like you have all day? <laughs> you are kidding me. I have got a list of things to do. So being a good person, and in my seminars I teach the four steps of behavior change. The second one is really awkward. I went into her bedroom when I wanted to clean it the next time and I threw myself on her bed. And I said, Ariana, how about we clean your room together today? What do you think? 
She said, Daddy, that's not you. <laughs> Do you think it worked? Absolutely. And it was so interesting because my son is vastly different. So I picked him up for Christmas just uh, a few, a month ago or so when they came home. And I was so excited to see Zachary. And so I see him like 30 feet across the way, Zachary! He's dead! And we run and we hug and it is a spectacle. <laughs> and my son loves it. Do you know what would happen to Ariana if I went, Ariana! She's going to hide in the restroom and say, I don't know who the crazy guy is. <laughs> I'm sitting in a restaurant with her, and she said, would you keep your voice down? People can hear us. They don't care what we're saying. <laughs> Interestingly enough, it worked. And I started changing my tone. And I gave my kids license to say when I was hurting them. That's a tough one, my friends, as parents, because I grew up with the parent is right, the child needs to learn. And I was switching it to say maybe the parent needs to learn so that the child can recognize that somebody knows them intimately and sees where they will be and loves them the way they need to be loved. Because then when I teach them about a God who will do the same thing to them, They'll buy it. But Ellen White has a statement, and I won't bother you with it because of the time, but she has a statement. She says, oftentimes we have people who sit at the feet of grace taking in information here, but it never goes home. And so the kids never learn what the Bible looks like. How sad. What's the third thing she said? Well, the third thing she says, Please recognize that I'm just a kid and I need to learn and I'm not all that bad. I, this is a six, seven year old kid. But did you, and Bible says, by the way, always think of other people better than yourself. Every interaction you have with anybody Think of them as better than yourself, the Bible says. Do you know what that would do, just that principle alone would do in a church family? Instead of, what an idiot, because he's not using my glasses. What an idiot. Maybe, just maybe, he's seeing life a little different. I could swear that half of you are dark. <laughs> but you know what? In my eyes, that's true. And let me suggest that none of us are done. And we're all on the journey. And we need patience to deal with each other. I think that's what the little lady was meaning. The S's, the number one thing they hate, the number one thing they hate is conflict. They will do anything to avoid conflict. They might even become passive aggressive. But boy, when they're done giving in, watch out. We can go through conflict at another time. The C is meticulous, analytical, self-disciplined, sensitive, cautious, detail-oriented. They do things the right way. When I put people into groups, which we won't do today, relax. But usually the second time I spend a couple hours and we put people into groups and we start asking questions, my number one question, interesting for you guys to hear, this is what I hear in churches. I say, so what is reverence in the sanctuary? Guess what the C's tell me? Well, we can't wear jeans in church. Um, we need to not talk in church because this is God's house. And they have a list of things and sometimes they all start with C. <laughs> the D's say, um, just need to be reverent. What's the next question? <laughs> 
Well, could you define reverent? Just be reverent. Reverent is what they think. The I's and the S's, I had one church literally that I only had two people on the I's and S's side. All the rest of them were C's and D's. And I asked the three people, I said, what's reverence in the sanctuary? And they said, if we can't connect with people, why would we come to church? Because as I connect with people, I connect with my heavenly father. Well, the C's say that we shouldn't talk in church. The S's and I's say that if I don't connect in church, now you notice the problem, and, and Ellen White is so clear, and the Bible is pretty clear too. Please don't quit meeting together. Because in meeting together, we save ourselves. If it was left up to the eyes, we would be in celebration and we'd never really know doctrine, but we'd be having a rip roaring time and we'd be singing and having all kinds of stuff. The problem of that is, is that there's no guardrails there and there may be affairs going on in that church because there's no law, there's no goodness and, and they need to be rubbed a little bit like barnacles need to be rubbed off. Um, it's fun to watch these groups. If it's left to the D's and C's, we're gonna have a church that's right. We may not be nice, but we're right. Or else. Or else. And if you don't see it my way, you better find yourself another church. And John 14, one to three says, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. What kind of a parent are we teaching that God is? Because maybe, just maybe, the God that we're teaching them isn't the parent they would want to live with for eternity. Precision, by the way, if you're a C, you probably have struggled, at least the statistics would prove, you've struggled with um, depression because the bar is set so high that God can't even meet it. By the way, now you see, oh, I I will say this, um, PET scans have shown that if you work outside of your brain lead, it will cost you, it'll be expensive. So for instance, if I ask Troy to be a, uh, cause he's a flaming eye, if I ask Troy to be um, an accountant at a little cubicle and look for the lost two or three cents. I quit. <laughs> okay, but I tell you, I know Troy, and if his life depended on it, he could do it, but he would come home and he would go, Honey, I can't do this. This is too, uh, this is exhausting. But if you ask him to be the tour director on a cruise ship, woohoo! He's gonna, honey, I get paid to do this. I'm energized. Woohoo, this is great. You know, the people that I met, and he's all into it. So remember, you will lose five to six years of your life if you're working outside of your brain lead. By the way, can I just say this? Doctrinally, what do the D's and C's believe doctrinally? We are the 28 fundamental beliefs and we're looking for that 29th and we're studying that thing and we're gonna get it down. And we hope that you all get it. By the way, I'd like to suggest that all the relational things that I teach should be doctrines in the Adventist church also but of course they wouldn't buy that because that's not their focus. The I's and S's think about spirituality as it's all about a relationship with Jesus. It's all about a relationship with Jesus and that's why the Bible says please don't quit meeting together because you need each other. If you have each other and you learn to work things out and you learn to do conflict well, you will have a church that is balanced and is functioning well. One special evidence that the Spirit of Christ is abiding in his church is unity of harmony which exists among its members. The brightest, this is the brightest witness. This is the brightest witness to the possession of true religion. 
for it will convert and transform the natural man and fashion him after. So then she goes on to say, the apostles differed widely in habits and dispositions, and she mentions them. See if you can find them. There were the publican, Levi Matthew. If you, if you read uh, Levi Matthew, you know, what did he do for a living? Yeah, and if you read his writing in Matthew, it's teachings and healings and teachings and healings and debit and credit and debit and credit. Then there's the fiery zealot Simon, the D, the uncompromising hater of the authority of Rome. Then there's the generous, impulsive I, the Peter, the mean-spirited Judas, Thomas, the true-hearted, yet timid, the S, and fearful, Philip, the slow of heart, inclined to doubt, and the ambitious, outspoken sons of Zebedee with their brethren. She goes on to say, these were all brought together with their different faults, all with inherited and cultivated tendencies. So we came packed with it three generations back. The devil doesn't play fair like Jesus does. He actually will pack your generations before you with bad stuff that you're gonna be tempted to do. Then you get to go to Walmart and pick up some of your own stuff. And now you can do it online. But in and through Christ, they were to dwell in the family of God, learning to do what? become one in faith, in doctrine, in spirit. They would have their tests and their grievances and their differences of opinions. But while Christ was abiding in the heart, there could be no dissension. My friend, when dissension comes, it's a sign that the evil one's work has been profitable. His love would lead to love for one another. The lessons of the master would lead to the harmonizing of all differences, bringing the disciples into unity till they would be of one mind, one judgment. Christ is the great center and they would approach one another just in proportion as they approach him. So real quick, I'm gonna give you a couple things and then we're done. There's tons of stuff. We usually do three or four hours on this. But I will say these are the folks that I think so. So um, I just would suggest that Paul is one of the D's in the Bible. If you didn't believe the way Paul did, he'd take you to Rome and put you in jail and hopefully you'd die. Converted Paul, what does he talk more about in his writings? Loving each other and grace of Christ. Do you notice the conversion of the stuff, the barnacles that were really hurting people were, were honed off and there's pink skin now. And then I love Peter, who else do you think could walk on water? I mean, how crazy is that? NEC would think, wow, and you can imagine in the boat, oh, there he goes again. And God valued him. And he said, sure, come on out. And he quieted at everybody and he met Peter. How did Jesus get Peter? Over and over and over and over and over again. How did he get Paul? Had to hit him with a two by four because sometimes it's tough to stop them in their tracks and had to give him a, a week with no sight so he could actually ponder things. Otherwise, he'd have been out doing his list. And then there's Abraham. How did God get Abraham's opinion? Uh, I, got his attention. He just uh, came through and he said, uh, I need a place to stay and something to eat. Uh, would you mind? Well, you know what an S will do? They will give you the shirt off their back. And so he entertained royalty. And who else but Moses is the C. I'm so glad Moses um, was the one God chose to give the law to, because if it was a Peter, when he was to write it down, he'd say, well, I have a note somewhere. I, 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 think, I, um, I think he said, uh, um, <laughs> No, in fact, how long was Moses up on the mountain? How many? 40 days, because he was going to get it right. And how did God get his attention? With a burning bush. What would Paul have done to the burning bush? Yeah, they'd have had that sucker out long before they know God was around. 
What would Peter have done to that bush? Well, let's have some marshmallows. And about three or four in the morning, they might have said, oh, the bush is still here. I wonder what's going on. What would the S have done? By, by the way, did you know your bush is on fire? Would you like help putting it out? Because they're the helping ones. But the C was just methodical enough and detailed enough to recognize the details and he saw that the bush wasn't burning and he met the Holy One. It's interesting, I believe his brother Aaron, of course, Moses doesn't think he can talk. He doesn't think he'll do it right. He says, I can't go to Egypt and talk. I'm not a public speaker. And so God says, I'll send, I'll send Aaron. Aaron was a really high eye. I mean, who else would have wanted to do the calf in 40 days and just sort of have a good time and, and enjoy life and not follow the rules and go outside of the rules? And guess who spoke when they got to Egypt? Yeah, Moses did. Because he knew Aaron wouldn't get it right. And all God had to do was to get him there. By the way, I hope that what you've done and what we usually do in the next couple hours is we put you into groups and we start dialoguing about how this works in this church and what are the things that really uh, you, you believe are the positive things of each other in the groups and what are the things that have been irritating and why is it irritating and maybe look through their glasses and see their perspective and begin to learn how to value each other and think of each other as better than yourself. Um, but I would just suggest this that God meets every person individually. He doesn't do it in mass. In fact, most of Jesus' interactions were one-on-one. -on -one. Some of his best stuff was passed one-on-one. -on -one. And if we learn about different people, as Ellen White says, we can be more effective for his good, to show the Jesus that works for them, to help them find. Like for instance, if I were to talk to Jerry McGee and say, let's do a, uh, let's do a personal devotion, and why don't we a journal? But to a young Jerry McGee, maybe jumping in a, a pile of leaves and smelling or walking out in the woods and enjoying nature will be the way he connects with God. But there is somebody in your church, by the way, who I know has journaled for 35 years. The writing is like a typewriter and she has kept records of when God has answered and when God hasn't. Is one better than the other? Absolutely not. What it is to say is that God will meet you where you are. And so if you feel that you don't belong, it may be because of the people who are sharing Jesus with you. I just want you to leave today knowing that he loves you because he made you. He doesn't make junk. Yeah. Um, I am wondering how do we get our kids back? How come all the kids are leaving the church? I think a large, a couple things that I think about why our kids aren't in church is number one, we've not done this well. They haven't watched us change. Um, and if God doesn't change my parents to love me in a certain way, number two, the church hasn't valued half of the church, half of our kids. We tell them you have to sing hymns and I'm gonna say something really strong here, very strong. How arrogant is it for one generation to suggest that it's their music that out of the 30 generations God chose to make it right? If you study music, music takes information into long-term memory instantaneously, so music is the most powerful thing and you know what, I could start singing a song right now and some of you would just start feeling warm because you grew up with it and you had these wonderful experiences with it. But our kids haven't had the experiences with our music, but they're having it with their music. My son's going to school right now and studying and he's studying different theologies and you know what, sometimes he calls and he says, Dad, how about this one? Have you looked at it this way? And I go, oh no, hang on. 
because that's not what I believe. But you know what I've learned? Is that when we all get to heaven, generationally, when we all get to heaven, we're all gonna go, oh, that's the way it was. And you know what? I'm learning to release that and study it. And yeah, I'm gonna agree with some things that I, that I study and I find I may not agree. But does that mean that I, I love my son less? Absolutely not. And does it mean that I'm gonna listen to music that probably doesn't really just energize me? Absolutely. My son has a song coming out in the, in the end of March and I'm gonna be singing it from that. I just love it because it's my son. And, and I want my son to know that I love him. I want my daughters to know I love them. I want them to know I would do anything for them and that there's nothing that they can do that won't make me love them. Because then what kind of a God will they serve? The same kind of a God. And he's gonna iron out music. He's gonna iron out theology. And I'm, by the way, I'm a theologian, I do study. And I do believe very specific things. I am not wishy-washy on my theology. But that's for me. I must let my son have the same process that I had. Because is there anybody here who has the same theology that you had 20 years ago? If you do, you haven't been growing. You are the, the 30th year into your first year Christianity. And Ellen White says, if you don't have an opinion that needs to be changed, you got something coming. <laughs> you need to be looking and constantly growing. And so I think a lot of it is we've just not had the openness to say your opinion matters. Maybe, maybe it's kind of like how it was when our son left home. I told God that I want to be a different person when he comes back home. So maybe we can say that in the church. We want to be different people when our kids come back home. Hallelujah. And by the way, your son came home. Yeah, he did. And he's still at home. I'm a different person. Amen to that? Now you just saw somebody who met Jesus. And I, I gave up the right to be this loud, bombastic dad who was right. I will do that with Zachary because we have a ball. And my wife and my daughter just sit there and listen to his talk and they can't follow it. But when I'm talking to my daughter, it's slower. It's methodical. And I'll never interrupt her because I'll never hear what she has to say if I interrupt her. I can't thank God enough for showing me this because my daughter, I love now because she calls both her mom and I and when she's interested in a boy or something, this emotional stuff, she actually wants to talk to me. Do you know how rich a reward that is? And then you know what, if I agree with it or don't agree with it, I'm not letting her know. Because I'm gonna let her grow in her way, just like my parents let me grow. And could I suggest that I am so much better because of where my parents came from? Did they know all this? Absolutely not. But they put me on their shoulders and they said, Gary, go. And I am where I am because of them. And now I put my kids on my shoulders and I say, Zachary, Ariane, and Emily Ann, go. And all the devil has to do is without asking, pull one generation out and we have to start all over because God doesn't use the devil's methods. But that also will speak, I believe, in the end of time because God doesn't use those methods. It is trustworthy. You can bank on it. It's freedom. It's about connection. Anyway, thank you all for staying. You have been so awesome. Let's pray. Jesus, we just love you. We're so glad that you don't make junk. And so I just ask that everybody that is in the earshot of my voice um, would go home knowing that God looks at them and smiles with joy. 
and knows that they're right where they need to be, they're not too fast and they're not too slow. Jesus, thank you for that opportunity to live in that kind of a safe environment amidst this world where the devil has gone wild. In Jesus' name, amen.